Welcome to Let's Code Games. This is the last episode of our racing series and today we want to make this prototype into a little bit of a game. We actually want to create a time trail game where we can race against ourselves. So we want to track the time, display the best time that we had on this course and we also want to make sure that we are not able to cheat, that we actually have to go around the course. So let's start by just creating some basic UI. Unity gives us a lot of UI elements that we can play with. And we just start out by going to game object, UI, and create a new text object. And you'll notice that the text object is immediately parented to a new canvas object. And the canvas is basically, it encapsulates everything that, that is UI. That, so, so you can draw images in there, you can draw text in there, make them scale with each other and relate to each other depending on screen size and stuff like that. So you see each each UI element has a rec transform, which is kind of like a transform but has more parameters that you can use to make UI look good on different screen sizes. And you have a canvas renderer, which every element has that actually wants to draw to the canvas. And in this case, we have a text component where we can type in text and make it make uh, change the font size and the font itself and stuff like that and we also added an outline component to it so we have a white text with a black outline so it, it's visible everywhere so at the moment you can actually see the UI is colliding with the 2d sprites so we have to make sure that the rendering order is correct so we create a UI layer make sure the canvas is labeled as rendering to the UI layer and then we can set the rendering order of those 2D layers to whatever we want, actually. So we make sure that the UI layer is rendering in front of everything. All right, so, so we have the current time, the last time, and the best time. That's, that's the stuff that we want to display here. To, to actually measure all of that, we create a new script called the Lab Manager. And managers, at least in my coding world, are always classes that only exist once and they they just handle something, they manage something about the, the game scene. So in this case, the lab manager is in charge of keeping the time, making sure that we're actually on track and, and stuff like that. So first of all, we have a variable called is lab started. Because actually when we start the game, we don't want to start the clock immediately because that would be kind of unfair to the player because they're not ready yet. Um, we actually want to wait until the player actually has hit the finish line or the starting line once and then start the clock. So the player can start at their own time. We want to have the current lap time and we want to have a last lap time and best lap time. We set up those values as float variables and we actually want to make them public properties. I was thinking about making them private before, but I changed my mind. So I want to make public properties for, for all of these. But to create properties, it's, it's, it's kind of dangerous because other, uh, to, uh, other components could change public properties without you knowing it. So I'm actually using a concept here called the getter and setter methods or accessors. And they make sure that these variables can only be accessed by however I define. So for the last lap time and best lap time, I say that Everybody can get the variable, so get it back, um, it's, it's public, but only, only the class itself can set the variable, so it's private set. And for the current lap time, I actually do something more fancy. So the, the get private set, this is a very standard way to do this. So this is a shorthand of basically saying, um, just making this variable um, accessible with uh, setting and getting the value without doing anything. But the getter and setter methods can actually contain logic, can contain code. And so whenever you do something or get the value, something happens. In, in our case here, the current lap time is actually being calculated every time you access it. So we always make sure that we get, get the most current value. So you can see here, first of all, I, I check if the lap has started. If it hasn't started, I always return zero. The current lap time is zero. But if, if it has started, I calculate the current time minus the time we started the lab. So that's actually the difference, the, the time that we currently in that lab. I'm using time.realtime since startup here, which is something that I often use when I, when I track time. Uh, Realtime since startup is the time measured from the start of your application to whatever now is. So 
it's not affected by time scale, pausing the game or anything like that. It depends. I mean, in this case, we actually might want to affect this, uh, have this affected by pausing the game. But since this is a prototype and we're not concerned with our pausing and doing stuff like that, I just use the first thing that came to my mind, and that's real time since startup. Okay, so we are going to set up a trigger event just like we did before. And in this trigger, we, we want to make sure that we are colliding with the car and then starting the lap. Actually, when we've already started the lap, we want to do something differently. But when we first hit the finish line, we want to set the Boolean value to true that we actually started and then measure the, the real time since startup and save that in, in, a, in, in, in a variable that we can access later. So this way, we always know the time when we actually hit the finish line and we can use that to calculate how much time has elapsed. Okay, so that's the lab manager. Um, I talked about it before. We also always want to separate our logic from the behavior that displays the code. So I'm, I'm creating a, a lab manager UI here and this UI component actually handles displaying the text, whereas the lab manager itself handles all the functionality of tracking the time and stuff like that. And by separating this, it's kind of like separating the car with the visuals object, right? We have the, the actual model, the, the behavior, and we have the visuals and we separated those. And we want to do the same here in code. So we have a lab manager and a lab manager UI that gets the values from the lab manager and then displays them on screen. And the reason why we separate it, this is because, for example, let's imagine we, we release this game on PC and later we want to release it on console or on tablets and the UI actually changes a lot. So we can throw out the, the PC UI and inject specific UI for tablets, stuff like that. And it's very easy by just disabling the PC UI and enabling the mobile UI. And um, by separating those as it's very, very simple to do that. The lab manager UI needs some, some helper methods. So actually it's, it's setting the, the info text every frame and, and we, uh, we're using uh, C, C sharp shorthands, the plus sign between different strings to attach multiple strings together here, um, just to make the code a little bit more readable. We could have all of that in one line, but I usually try to make the code as readable as possible. Even if it's more verbose, it's, it's always good to have your code very structured in a way so you can read it very easily. And yeah, so we, we update, we update the, the text every frame. And we also have a helper method to display the, the text in a human readable form, the time actually. So we're tracking the time in a float value. So we have the number of seconds to measure the time, but we want to, we want to transfer that float value into a human readable time form. And, and something that, that feels a little bit more exciting. So right now we're testing it out. We have, um, oh yeah, again, I actually forgot to set this as a trigger. So we start the time, you can see the clock starting to take here, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds, and stuff like that. But since the lap is rather short, it only takes us six seconds or seven seconds, it's, there's a lot of space waste, wasted, right? We don't need minutes and we don't need the 10 second slot. Maybe we do, but, yeah, we can we can turn this around a little bit. So so let's add the uh, a fraction after the second. And it's not really useful for the current lab because you you won't look at that value now. But for the for the best lab when you when you're tracking your best lab and comparing your last lab to the best lab, it's it's better to see more values behind um, uh, the the second separated out into smaller values. So we're trying out like tenth uh, tenth second here by basically just. Um, um, getting getting just the fraction basically a part of it we're multiplying by 10 and then we're rounding that value and and by multiplying by 10 we we actually just get the first step after after the fraction and let's see what what that looks like so now we have the 10 seconds there um, going up faster but we actually want to have one more slot in there we want to have the hundreds uh, seconds as well so, so I mean, again, it, it helps you comparing the best time to your last time, but also in the current time, 
it creates some sort of tension. You see how the seconds count up really, really quickly there because we have so many fractions behind it. It just for a racing game that creates just a feeling of of tension and and and, and that you need to go fast. So just by having just by displaying that that time in a little bit of a different way, we can actually add to the atmosphere of a racing game here. That looks pretty good, actually. So we already have the last uh, and the and the best lap there. But as you can see here, we can actually cheat. We can simply just go over the finish line over and over again in a circle. So that's not really useful, right? So we want to make sure that the, the player actually goes around the track completely. And as always, there are many, many different ways we can we can deal with that. The way that I chose to, to deal with that is that I create more triggers, like hidden triggers on the track. And in this case, I use four of them. So one for the finish line, one going after the first corner, one going after the second corner, and one after the third. So I have hidden I have four hidden triggers on the map and the player actually has to touch them in order for the for the lab manager to actually trigger the time. That's That's actually my thinking here. So I created a script called LabLine and I copied some code over that I used in the lab manager before, just refactoring here a little bit, separating out that logic from just the lab manager manager to a separate script that I can use for all the components and uh, let's start to refactor a little bit. So since the trigger is now no longer on the lab manager because I want to have four different triggers, I actually need to, need to get a reference to the, the lab manager. And in my design, I will put all these uh, lab lines as children of the lab manager. So I can use a simple function call like get component in parent to get a reference to the lab manager. That's just my design choice here. And I, since this is a very small prototype, I'm just assuming that I'm doing this right. But you can always do some checks here, checking for null reference and stuff like that, just to make sure that you actually did it right and not a, a game object is not somewhere where it's not supposed to be. But again, we are having a very, very small prototype here, so I don't care about checking about this. I assume that I'm doing this right for four game objects. <laughs> okay, so again, we're checking if the trigger, the, the collider that's, trigger, um, that's, that's um, hitting us is actually the car. And then I have some um, I'm, I'm refactoring the, the lab manager now to have different callbacks for when I ha hit the, the different lab lines or when I hit the finish line. And these methods that I have here, the on lab line pass and on lab line uh, and on finish line pass, um, they, they're actually named very specifically like that. Um, every time I name something with an on before, it means an event has happened and something else is triggering that event. And by, by giving them these, these different functions, I can actually later on read this in more plain English. I can read this class and I see on lab line pass. All right, so I know this is an event that is triggered somehow. I don't really care how it's triggered, but I, I, know, I know when it's supposed to be triggered by just reading that name and knowing that this is an event with the, with the on before that. Okay, so we have different lab lines here and we need to make sure that the lab lines are being hit in order so that after you fit the last lab line and then hit the finish line again, we actually trigger the, the time. So we're giving every lab line will have an index component, uh, an index variable, and we're passing on that index, which have I hit. And, and now I can basically check is the index that I've hit bigger than the last index that I've hit, then I've progressed down the course. If it's smaller or the same, then I'm, I'm staying in the same area or I'm going backwards. So, so that's very, very useful to, to uh, that's, that's a very good way to check if I'm going forward or backward. And you could ask, actually, if you, if you want to go uh, use this further, you can actually display, uh, you're going backwards, your eye text uh, to the player once you recognize that you're going backwards, for example. Right now I'm writing a helper uh, function because I want to get the index of the highest lap line. And in this example, I could just type four in there because I know I have four, but 
imagine I'm creating a game where I want to have different tracks and they might be more advanced and have more lap lines. So I actually want to calculate the highest lap line because knowing the highest lap line lets me calculate when I actually reach the end and reach the finish line. So you can see here if the index is zero, which is basically the first, the, the finish and start line, I, I check if a little bit if I ha haven't started or if I actually hit the last lap line before, then I call the on finish line past event. And if this is not zero, then I, I check if I hit the lines in order and count, and I count actually which one I hit last. Okay, so I actually need to make need to make sure that all the indexes are set up correctly, of course. And then you can see here, well, we are supposed to be triggering the line, but something is not uh, is not right yet. So let's see what what happens here. So we actually um using some some debug logs here to to see what's going on. So this is always useful if if something is not behaving the way you you think, you can put some debug logs in there and see in the console, you can see what's happening. So you can try to figure out where your code is going wrong. And I think in this case, I actually found it. I just had a, had a wrong sign there. So I'm passing first line, the second line, the third line, and now I'm passing the finish line and the time is actually tracked. So uh, just by putting in the, the debug logs in there, I actually found the mistake immediately. Um, which also sometimes happens. Um, it's, it's always good to just go through your code line by line thinking about what's supposed to be doing and then you can see if, if something is wrong. So I, I remove all the debug logs here because everything works as intended. And then I can start, start playing the game and try to, to get some, some good times in here. All right, and, and that's actually it. It works as intended. It's, it's, it's calculating the, the best time, it's calculating our last time and showing it so we can compare. And, and now we can try to get a high score, get a good lap time in our own game here. And that, that is everything for this series. So um, we've made our own small, very small racing game here um, where we can race against ourselves and get the high score. And I hope you enjoyed this, this introduction into, into Unity. So we used some very basic physics here, some collisions, learned about forces, we learned about triggers and how we can use triggers and tags to, to have different behavior whenever you, you collide with an object. And we actually learned a few of the Unity basic classes like input and time and stuff like that. So this was a very, very basic prototype, um, but we made it in one hour, which is, which is super nice. Uh, so this, this one hour, one game series is supposed to do that. And we want to make many, many small prototypes so you can learn how different genres are, or rather how I would tackle different genres and stuff like that. So I hope you enjoyed this. I want to thank uh, Kenny actually. Kenny creates these amazing assets that we used here and he releases them for free. So go to his website and check out what other assets he has if you want to do some prototyping, want to learn how to use Unity, you actually have some beautiful assets to work with so, so your prototypes look a little nicer. And his link is down below. And that is it for, for our racing series. Um, you can download the code and the assets to the Unity project down below as well. And I hope you, you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. If you have suggestions what type of genres you want to see next in this one hour one game series, let us know as well. As we said before, this is very much an experiment for us. So we want to try different things. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.